Welcome back. Last time I finished reinstalling the engine and transmission. This time I'll be hooking up the wiring so we can get closer to starting the car. It all started when I was doing a weight reduction. I had removed the audio harness already and had cut out numerous other wires that weren't being used. This left me with a big ball of tangled wires which isn't the easiest to deal with. I was in a conundrum where it might have been more work to make this harness work than to start from scratch. However, I decided to stick with the old harness as it wasn't clear what a lot of it did and remaking it would be a big risk. I started out by removing the stock bulky fuse box. I had depinning tools to try and keep the wires intact, but none of them worked naturally. The power distribution system is easy enough to remake, hence my decision to take this part out. Well, I've got everything labeled and disconnected from the main fuse box, so I don't have to deal with this piece of crap anymore. Plan is to redo the power distribution by getting a new fuse block, hopefully filter through some of this stuff, because there's no way I need this much stuff. I can get rid of the ABS and traction control computer, because I'm not going to be running ABS, I'm redoing all my brake lines. So I'm going to cut out this next, and I guess we'll see where that gets us. ABS harness has officially been removed. I have some acceleration sensor connectors here that I might want to use if I ever do a data logger of some sort. But uh, besides that, that's all out. And I still got all this. So. Damn it. I continued fitting the harness by removing connectors and wires with things I knew I didn't need. I played it safe at first, but over time I took more and more chances with what I removed for the sake of progress. I'd had enough of the rat's nest, so I moved on to the engine harness. Thankfully, this is almost entirely a separate harness, so no major modifications were needed here. That doesn't mean it was easy to plug in. I had to double check my work to make sure all the plugs were in the right spot. I had a pin diagram for the ECU, so I went pin by pin and checked continuity to make sure they're all in the right place. I did have to fix a couple of things, and I almost forgot the crank sensor, but eventually I got everything put in place. The body harness got plugged in as much as it could, and I continued thinning it now that I knew where everything went. I decided to rewire even more systems, including the lighting, since it would be easier than keeping it tangled in. I had already removed the body control harness and the lighting control module, so the wires were going nowhere anyways. I'll be remaking the controls for these systems as well as the wipers too. Eventually, I had a pile of wires that I'd removed. I'd be reusing some of these connectors, so I was sure to save them. With all the essentials in, I focused on powering up the ECU and reflashing it for the immobilizer delete. There are some good diagrams online from the MS-43 ECU, and I followed a simple one for bench flashing it. Only a few power and grounds are needed to the ECU, and to be safe, I didn't plug in any of the unused engine harness connections. I did have to give power and ground to the OBD port too, with the K line the only connection required from the ECU to the OBD port. I also needed a K plus DCAN USB adapter for my laptop, but these are readily available. The software I used was called MS4X Flasher, which was simple to use. I read the entire flash memory off the ECU and saved it as a backup. Then I followed a guide in a forum to edit the flash memory manually to skip the immobilizer subroutines in the firmware for my firmware version. I didn't disassemble the code to verify this for the sake of time, so I was trusting the forum to have accurate information. I reflashed the ECU with its updated memory, not forgetting to fix the checksum, which was easy with the flasher tool. If this isn't done, the ECU will notice something has changed, and it won't work because it thinks something is corrupted. I power cycled the ECU, then read back all the memory and verified it to make sure it matched what I had written. Everything looked good, so I continued on. I wasn't going to know if it worked until I wired up the rest of the essentials. I started out with ignition switch. A simple set of tests with my multimeter revealed how the circuits work. One wire connects to the common wire for each position. Ignition, run, and start. Next, I had to make the power distribution system. I had cut out the battery wires, but these were still good to reuse. 
I got a special crimper to install some new eyelets with heat shrink tubing applied after. This system really isn't that complex. I have a main power switch that switches all the power. Then, the key is used to trigger a relay that then allows the power to go to the fuse box. I laid out all the power cables in the passenger area. The alternator and starter are on their own cable that goes back to the battery, mostly that the car can't power itself with the switches off. This cable has its own 250 amp fuse, separate from the fuse box. I also added a thermal resettable breaker to the cable that supplies everything else. This is to make sure that any short before the fuse box will still shut the car down. Next, I had to figure out how to make the starter motor crank. There are a couple open wires in the starter. I discovered one needs to be switched to ground, which was done by the immobilizer, but since there isn't one anymore, I tied it to ground. The next needs to be given power to trigger the relay on the starter motor, which then switches the starter motor on. Now that I knew how the starter motor worked, I switched focus to the intake manifold so I could connect everything else. This took some more trial and error, but I was able to get the connections in properly. Then I went back to the starter motor. I didn't want to crank the motor without oil, so I filled it up, adding some brake and additive. Then, after connecting the power cable to the starter, I did a quick check to verify. So this is my starter control wire, so it should crank. Battery's low, but yes, that does crank, that's good. I wanted to make sure everything was mounted properly before continuing to avoid any short circuits. I mounted up the steering brace, cut out the unused metal, and made a mounting surface for my fuse box. I made this panel out of ABS with speed nuts to make the mounting easier. This got welded into the brace with some new tabs to mount it nicely beneath the old airbag cover. After I finished welding, I rust converted the whole thing because it was getting rusty. Then, I glued my dash pad together that I had torn by mistake and mounted a panel from the main switch. The dashboard and fuse box got installed and I hooked up all the power wires I knew I needed for the ECU. I kept most fuse values the same. For the other ones, I kind of guesstimated. I switched the power on and did an impedance check on the fuel pump relay output. The ECU switches low to trigger the relay and then after a moment goes high to turn off the relay. Sure enough, I saw this was working which tells me the ECU isn't fried. Next, I checked the ignition outputs to see if the ECU would try to start the engine. Unfortunately, I had no luck. I wasn't even seeing a spark at the spark plugs. I checked the major sensor inputs by back probing and sure enough the crank and cam sensors were fine. Well that looks pretty good. You can see the missing tooth right there. And scroll around, we can see it's on one of the cycles. Alright, well let's try the cam sensor number two next. So yellow is the exhaust cam and blue is the intake cam. So that means it's going exhaust and quickly intake, which makes sense. It should be right in the middle, this transition, but I think it's getting screwy because of the engine speed is dipping. Um, so it might look like it's skewed. But it's getting a good signal, that's an important thing. Suspecting the forum post I referenced wasn't reliable, I used a different tool to patch the flash memory to delete the EWS. This also updated the firmware to a newer version, which was a plus. I can make a separate video on how I did this since it didn't require any boot mode flashing. Then I did a quick crank check and sure enough, I had spark. There's still a bit left to do, such as the cooling fan and dash, but I'll cover these in the other videos. At this point, at least you know the engine will try to start. As always, thanks for watching, feel free to like and subscribe, and come back for the next part where I install a shiny new fuel system. Oh yeah, look at that. That's a fuel cell.